everyone to this uh, 2 p.m. meeting of the House Committee on Higher Education and Technology. Um, to begin with, I will ask our Vice Chair, uh, Representative DeCoit, to cover some of the procedures that'll be used in this uh, Zoom hearing. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members in or and, and guests, in order to allow as many people to testify as possible, there will be a two minute time limit per testifier. Please keep yourself muted and your video off while waiting to testify and after your testimony is complete. The Zoom chat function will allow you to chat with the technical staff only. Please use the chat only for technical issues. If you are disconnected unexpectedly, you may attempt to rejoin the meeting. If disconnected while presenting testimony, you may be allowed to continue if time permits. Please note the house is not responsible for any bad internet connections on the testifier's end. In the event of a catastrophic network failure, it may be necessary to reschedule the hearing or schedule a meeting for decision making. In that case, an appropriate notice will be posted. Please refrain from profanity or uncivil behavior. Such behavior may be grounds for removal from the hearing without the ability to rejoin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, to begin with, I'm going to ask our members' indulgence, and we're going to take two bills out of order, um, HB 1070 and HB 1072. Um, one of our UH uh, participants has a, another commitment. So out of um, consideration for him, we'll begin with HB 1070. And this relates to university districts. And first up, we have um, DLNR Russell Suji. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee, Russell Suji for the department. We submitted, uh, we'll, we'll stand on our written comments that we submitted, um, and, and I'm here for available questions. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have um, Office of State Planning, uh, Justin Minipali. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. The Office of Planning has submitted comments and raising concerns. We'll stand on that testimony and I do have staff available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have the University, University of Hawaii, Calvert Young. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair members. Uh, thank you for your accommodation of taking your agenda out of order. The university has provided testimony uh, in support of this measure. Uh, we can stand on that testimony. Uh, myself and other members of the university are also available for any uh, technical questions um, that the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Calvert. And uh, that is all the testimony we have on 1070. So members, do we have any questions? Seeing none, I do have a question for um, Mr. Young from the UH. And it relates to a uh, testimony we received from the Office of State Planning, which raises some um, questions about the management of uh, UH property that falls under um, special management areas. And so I wanted to ask uh, you, how many UH properties does this involve that fall into either coastline or special management areas? Uh, so I'm not uh, totally certain for sure, but um, by our, our, our reading of the bill, the bill actually uh, limits the application of uh, SMA to uh, campuses with an SMA that's under the purview of this bill to um, contiguous parcels of real estate that are held by the university or in partnership uh, with a qualified person, et cetera, et cetera that comprise the university campuses at Manoa, Hilo, West Oahu, or each of the seven community colleges. Uh, with that limited definition, we think there's actually only one campus that is actually located within, within the SMA. However, um, in, you know, out of re recognition for the uh, testimony that we've seen from um, OSP, um, you know, we can, I think I think whatever their recommendations, accommodations, issues, um, I think it is uh, workable for inclusion in the bill. Okay, thank you. And just uh, 
out of curiosity, which of the community colleges fall under that category? So I, I believe that might be um, Maui Community College. I'm, I, I see um, General Counsel uh, Jesse Suki um, included in the hearing. If you would indulge uh, allowing him, he may have some particular insight. Okay, Mr. Suki, do you have uh, more information for us? Oh, yes, uh, it's just the Maui College in the SMA. It is Maui Co College. Okay, thank you very much. No more questions. Um, let's go on to uh, House Bill 1072, dealing with UH tuition and fees, special fund. And we have um, from the UH, uh, Calbert Young. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, University of Hawaii has submitted testimony in support of this measure, and we can stand on that testimony available for any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Okay, and that is all the testimony we have on this bill. Um, members, any questions? Seeing none, okay, we'll move on, thank you. So going back to the original order of our hearing, um, we have House Bill 1067, um, General Contractors Association, Cheryl uh, Walthall, offering support. Um, University of Hawaii, Jan Govea. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, we have submitted testimony in support of this measure and stand on it. We are here to answer any questions. All right, thank you. And um, this is um, for members information, a, um, a UH bill that uh, removes the sunset for this statute. <clears throat> nope, seeing no questions, let's move on to HB 1226 uh, relating to violation of privacy. And first up we have Chris Van Marder, Department of the Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney. Uh, Chris, you may be muted. Or do we have a... Thank you, Chair Takayama. Uh, Chris Van Marder, Deputy Prosecutor. Um, as the Chair may know, I was a member of the 21st Century Privacy Law Task Force that was committed by a House resolution in 2019. And as a member of that committee, um, we took up the issue of facial recognition repeatedly, probably five or six different uh, sessions. And at the end of our task force work, the task force decided not to um, propose any legislation in this area. Um, a couple of points I wanna make just real quickly. If you were to ask the proponents of this bill whether anyone in Hawaii has been convicted of a crime as a result of facial rec recognition technology, the answer would be no. Uh, the answer would also be no if you were to ask the proponents of this bill whether anyone's even been arrested in Hawaii as a result of facial recognition technology. They may point to other states. We don't know what software they're using, but what Hawaii is doing has not resulted in anyone being arrested or convicted as a result of facial recognition technology. The ACLU has been a big proponent of this measure. They may point to their study, but the problem with their study has been that they tweaked the software that was used in their study in a way that lowered the threshold that resulted in false positives. And when the study was redone using the thresholds that law enforcement was to use, it resulted in no misidentification. So uh, pointing to their own study is not a justification for this bill. And just lastly, if we adopt this bill, it's gonna make it really hard for law enforcement uh, to investigate cases. For example, the Capitol riot a couple of weeks ago, many of the suspects who invaded the Capitol have been identified with facial recognition software. If we take that tool away from law enforcement, we can't use that in those types of investigations where we literally have to rely on video to identify who these mass perpetrators are. So for those reasons, we would ask you to defer the bill 
back to the 21st Century Privacy Law Task Force for more consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have um, Jake Parker, Security Industry Association. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Jake Parker with the Security Industry Association, representing companies that provide safety and security products in Hawaii and nationwide. Our members include the leading developers of facial recognition technology available in the U.S. and others that incorporate it into building systems and other related technologies. We support policies that ensure facial recognition is only used for appropriate purposes and for ethical uh, in ethical ways. The concern we have with this bill, as it's currently drafted, is that it would instead ban all public sector uses outside of several limited exceptions. Not only would this prevent the adoption of new technology, it would also undermine current beneficial applications in Hawaii. The concerns about this technology center around uses that may have privacy or civil liberties implications. However, many uses of the technology do not raise such concerns. Just like unlocking your phone, facial recognition enabled access control allows a user to unlock a door or access a secured area. It also is used to increase security in and around public buildings, protecting employees, visitors, and other occupants. It also provides touchless access that can be linked to temperature screening technologies. These are now being rapidly deployed to reduce exposure to COVID-19. While the bill provides a limited exception for such uses at airports, uh, these are not the only public sector facilities where the technology is needed. A number of schools and other uh, government facilities in Hawaii do currently use the technology for these purposes, but they would be prohibited from doing so if the bill were enacted in its current form. Additionally, a quick word about the law enforcement exemption, um, as was just, just stated, is currently written the bill would not allow uh, investigators to um, search data that's outside Hawaii's mugshot database, which may be necessary uh, to investigate certain crimes such as human trafficking and child sexual exploitation. It should be revisited given the tremendous success in using specialized tools of facial recognition to help rescue more than 15,000 children from human trafficking in the last four years in the US. Most of all, we urge the committee to consider amending the bill in a way that would, rather than banning new uses of technology, uh, provide a process for allowing uses that meet certain conditions for transparency, accuracy, and accountability uh, to go forward. In my written testimony, you'll find our recommended changes that will allow for such a process. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, that's all the testimony we have, members. Any questions? Okay. Representative Gannadin. This question is directed to Mr. Van Murder? Yes. Um, so to be clear, should you want to um, include facial recognition information, you could you could use that as of right now in um, say an information packet to be um, given to a grand jury. Um, so they might find probable cause for the pursuit of charge. Is that how it would work? Well, the way it works, um, the state attorney general's office maintains a software program that the four county law enforcement agencies use. So when HPD has a case, for example, involving video surveillance, the kind of cases we see on the news every night, they will use the software to help them identify potential suspects that are in that AG database. But the policy of HPD, which is on their website, specifically says they're not allowed to use the software match as a basis to make an arrest or to charge. All they do is they use the software results to then find six photographs, and then they show the six photographs to a potential witness to see if they can identify. And it's that type of identification that's used to make an arrest. So the software is simply making it easier for the police department to find potential um, individuals who are then shown to the witness. So uh, we don't use facial recognition software at all at grand jury or in court. It's simply used as a tool to limit the scope of potential suspects so we can show that to a live witness or victim. Okay, with, with this facial recognition software be used to develop a profile of a um, of an individual that law enforcement is looking for? No, in fact, uh, HPD's policy, which is on their website, prohibits anything like that. All they're allowed to do when they use the software is to input in the potential features of their suspect. For example, male, female, uh, race or ethnicity, color of hair, eyes, et cetera. 
and then the software will give them potential uh, matches. And then they'll take the six best matches, put a photo lineup together and show the six photos to a potential a victim or witness to see whether they can make an identification. The software doesn't identify anyone. It just produces possible um, subjects that a witness could look at. What I'm concerned about is the software exacerbating potential human biases. Um, so, which are kind of well documented in law enforcement, um, the kinds of things that uh, civil rights protects. Um, Thank you so much for, for your response. Members, any other questions? Seeing none, let's move on to um, House Bill 1312, dealing with uh, intellectual property, uh, UH. Uh, first up, we have uh, Nicholas Comerford, University of Hawaii College of Tropical Agriculture. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and and committee members, I'm the Dean of the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. We support the intent of this bill because we do believe in producing things for the state of Hawaii, but as written, we oppose the measure and provide detailed comments. Thank you. That's all the testimony we have. Um, members, any questions for Dean? Seeing none, thank you. We'll move on. Um, House Bill 33. Information Technology Steering Committee. Um, first up, we have Brooke Connor, Department of Education. Thank you, Chair and committee members, and good afternoon. Uh, the department will stand on its written testimony in support of this bill, and we are available for any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Douglas Murdoch, off State Office of Enterprise Technology Services. Aloha, we will stand on our written testimony in support of the bill and we're standing by to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, Christine Sakuda, Transform Hawaii Government. Aloha Chair Takayama, Vice Chair DeCoit and members of the Committee on Higher Education and Technology. I'm the Executive Director of Transform Hawaii Government. It's a nonprofit organization and we are a coalition of organizations and individuals who advocate for an accessible, accountable and responsive state government that leverages technology to help citizens, communities and businesses thrive throughout Hawaii. We are in support of this bill. Um, we are, I do sit on the IT steering committee and um, we are excited to have um, representatives from other departments such as the Department of Education and the University of Hawaii um, and we are here to stand by for any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's all the testimony we have. Uh, members, any questions for our testifiers? Seeing none, let's move on. Next bill up is uh, House Bill 686, dealing with uh, critical infrastructure. And we have from the Honolulu Police Department, uh, Michael Kunishima. Good afternoon, Chair. The Honolulu Police Department stands on its written testimony in support of this bill. We're here for any questions. Thank you. Um, Department of the Prosecuting Attorney, Honolulu, Mark Tom. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney, Mark Tom for the department. Uh, the department um, stands on its written testimony, just providing comments. Yeah, we'll be here for questions. Thank you. Uh, Hawaiian Electric Company, Jonathan Grems. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'll stand by my written testimony. However, I would like to briefly point out that each year we have numerous thefts and damages that affect our ability to provide reliable and safe electrical power. The intent of the bill is to protect the public by providing a proportionate level of deterrent that our traditional fences, cameras, and security guards cannot. We're also sensitive to the public's right to freely move about and exercise their First Amendment rights. We believe the language in the bill protects those rights by stating critical electrical infrastructure does not include support offices, land use for the transmission of electricity, or right-of-way that is not completely enclosed 
and maintained by the electrical utility. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let's see. Next we have um, David Mullinex. Not present. Uh, he has a statement in opposition. Uh, let me note at this time that we have um, written comments in support from the Hawaii State Fire Council, the State Department of Transportation, uh, the Maui Fire Department. And in addition, we have several dozen uh, written statements in opposition from a number of individuals. And I want to assure everyone who has submitted testimony, both um, written and otherwise, that um, all of it has been received by the committee and been reviewed by our members. So at this time, I'm gonna ask members if they have any questions. Representative Capella. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'm not sure who the best person would be to actually have them addressed to. So I, if possible, if Mr. Tom, um, would be able to answer my questions? Yes. Perfect. Um, so for me personally, and then after reading a lot of the testimony in opposition, I am really concerned about the origin of this bill. And apparently this proposal is moder modeled after legislation put forward by the American Legislative Exchange Council that has and was enacted to criminalize climate change protesters in places like Oklahoma. Um, and I guess, are you aware of this measure is history in other states, and would you be able to speak to that or elaborate on that for the committee? I apologize, uh, Rep. Um, we did not introduce this bill. I do not know the origins of this bill. Um, my guess would, just in the basic understanding that I have of critical electrical infrastructures, that would mainly probably be more of a HECO um, issue. Um, so I, I apologize, I do not know the origins of this bill or um, why, or who introduced it or why. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Rep Capella, would you like to give the opportunity to Hawaiian Electric? Go yes, okay. please. Thank you, uh, Chair. Mr. Brahms, are you there? Yeah, hi. Um, I can't speak to the origin of the bill that you're talking to on the mainland, however, Again, that's why we added language to make sure it includes specific areas that are enclosed or fenced in. So we're, we're fine with protesters. We, we welcome people to exercise their First Amendment right. We're talking about inside the facilities, right? So inside a chain fence, inside a building, places where only people that are trained to be around electrical generation and transmission should be. So the, okay. east, the right of way, the sidewalks, the driveways, all of that exterior of the power plant or the substation is not considered part of this bill. Okay. Chair, I have a couple more questions. I'm Please sorry. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, I think Mr. Tom actually might be the best person to ask this. In, in your testimony, you talk, um, a little bit about um, the critical electrical infrastructure and what that might encompass. So the definition of critical infrastructure contained in this bill does seem very, very broad um, and a little bit far reaching encompassing any facility used uh, to support the generation, transmission or distribution of electricity. Um, what kind of actions and locations would this definition cover? Um, and I know that the previous answer kind of covered that, but I, in the bill specifically, it's not, it's not very well defined. Um, and I guess I'm asking because I really am concerned about the, the potential of something like this violating First Amendment protections for free speech, and it's not well defined in this um, piece of legislation. So I was wondering if you could expand on that as well. Yes, uh, Rep. Um, if my understanding from Mr. Grems is that it's in relation to what's enclosed uh, fence. Um, our concern, or I guess our comments regarding the definitions was um, that to the normal person that might be outside of the uh, of HECO, um, I myself would not know a power generation facility 
Um, maybe I might know that if I look at something, it's a facility with power generation. However, I might not know it specifically. That specific one is used at times of high demand. Um, this could be as simple as, as just around the fencing area or where you're not to be uh, enter or remain. Uh, would just have notifications, some signage, something letting an individual know when they hop this fence, when they go into this facility, um, that they are entering, uh, say, a critical electrical infrastructure. Um, I do understand where, um, I guess maybe that you're, what you're pointing out to is maybe subsection five, because it just says any other facility used to support the generation, transmission, distribution of electricity. Um, I don't know, that seems to me more like a catch-all, um, but I'm sure HECO um, has specific uh, infrastructure that, they, that that relates to. I just am not aware. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not aware of what that would, in, that would cover, but mis maybe Mr. Grems has a more understanding of that catch-all. Okay, um, you, and speaking of that, we already have trespass laws in statute. So does this measure, from, to your knowledge, does this measure target any behavior that would not already be covered by existing state law? And relatedly, how do the penalties um, envisioned by this law currently set as a class C felony compare with our existing trespassing laws? Um, well, we do have criminal trespass. Um, how this is, a, um, they're uh, creating a class C felony for this criminal trespass. Um, honestly, this, you know, this, this would be more of a policy decision. Um, if the legislature feels that criminal trespass into a critical electrical infrastructure rises to that level, that's something that the legislature has the right and ability to do uh, for our office, particularly if the legislature finds that, that policy is needed uh, to perfect, for protect these infrastructures, our office will uh, prosecute accordingly. Um, so I apologize if that's not the most clearest answer, but it clearly is maybe more of a policy call on um, how much uh, effort is to deter this type of behavior. Sure, one more question. Please. Um, go for ahead. the officer from HPD, the captain. Here we go. Uh, yes, that's that's the yeah. Proceed. Okay. Um, has there been any incident that has occurred in the last year that makes this measure necessary? Um, because on its surface, it really seems that, and the many people that have provided testimony in opposition have noted that it really just looks like this bill is specifically meant and intended to target climate change and indigenous rights activists. So I just would like to know if there has been anything um, that hap has happened in the last year. Sorry. Um I, I don't have that information offhand. I, I don't know um, on any type of criminal trespassing that was made that would specifically tries to target this. But um, if it did happen and if it, you know, the negative consequences of somebody doing that and not having any um, recourse to address it um, and the severity of, you know, what damage they could do, I think um, warrants, you know, a higher penalty. Okay. Thank you very I'd, much. I'd be happy to offer some comments to some of your questions. Okay, I'm sorry, who is this speaking? Hi, this is John Grimms from HECO. Oh, uh, Mr. Grimms, go ahead. Right. So actually over the past three years, we've had 79 known trespassing cases. So those are the ones we've actually caught and turned away. After they've entered our facilities, we've had ATVs stolen, we've had a vehicle stolen, over $10,000 worth of copper stolen, not to mention the number of times that we've had to repair these fences or the equipment. As in the testimony from the fire department, we have had several people seriously injured and one actually die. While I was with the police department years ago, I responded several times to, well, at least twice to two people that were died as they entered into these facilities and attempted to steal copper. So there's a need not only to protect the public and the infrastructure, 
but the people actually committing these crimes. And we believe that a higher penalty would be a better deterrent because currently it is a petty misdemeanor to trespass on these facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, Re Representative Ganadin, please proceed. Um, following Mr. Grimms, good afternoon. Following the line of questioning from Representative Popella, um, copper, to your knowledge, is a stealing a certain amount of copper, to your knowledge, is a Class C felony, right? Correct. Right. So you're, the examples that you're giving, you would be charging someone with both um, being on the property as well as another C felony, is that correct? So you're, so you're, you're hoping to add, so you're hoping to um, have the state add another charge to um, something that, that that we just um, added further criminalization, criminalization to just a few years ago. Is that correct? Partially correct, but as you know, when cases get prosecuted, they go in a number of different directions, right? So someone may trespass onto the property and attempt to steal the copper. Prosecutors may choose not to prosecute that part of the case, we would still have the trespass to fall back on. And again, this is more of a deterrent to let people know this is a serious crime. It can cause serious injury or death. All right. Um, to your knowledge, uh, what is what is the Class C felony for, um, for theft? So I, I believe it's, um, correct me, Chair, if I'm wrong, I believe it's um, over $750. That's correct. So, um, so if an individual were to go onto a HECO property and steal something that you would argue be over seven hundred fifty dollars, there would also be another class of felony. Is that correct? Possibly, yes. Okay. And then um, breaking and entering—that's also a class of felony, isn't it? Yes, it is. So uh, you probably want to talk to the prosecutor of the police department about that because there are several different degrees. Well, Mr. Grimes, you're, you're asking the state to protect eco property, so I'm not going to do um, Are you interested in lesser included offense? Should this should this proceed? So, um, a class C felony, as well as other charges to be stacked on to people. So, well, would, would that would that uh, satisfy eco's desire to create a deterrent? We are, we are open to all suggestions on how to best deter people from coming onto the property and damaging the critical infrastructure or injuring themselves. I'd like to point to page two, line 19. The bill, a power generation facility used, used specifically during times of high demand. In your estimation, what is the time of high demand? Well, it depends on when the use of electricity is greatest and that depends on several different factors. So you would determine that, not, not it wouldn't be in the statute. That, so, would have to be, that would have to be proven by the power generator or the power company. So if someone were to um, commit the C felony of breaking entering onto this private property and then let's say they came in at, uh, 5.55 p.m. Um, and um, just a few minutes earlier, there was a power spike. Now it would be a, a class C felony. Is that what you're intending to do? Based on, based on your assessment later on in court, most likely before a jury as to when there was a high demand. All right, well, I think you have to keep in mind that the state of mind is reckless. So they have to consciously disregard the unjustifiable risk of the conduct. So we have to show their state of mind as well. So if we can't prove that, then it would fall back to a petty misdemeanor. So there are numerous elements. So you'd have to prove a reckless state of mind as well as this further element of high demand. Is that correct? The high demand is separate, right? So basically, Coming onto the property to commit a crime 
in itself would be a violation of the statute. If you, if you were to step onto a power plant, break into the power plant, while power plant, Kai power plant, that would be, that would fall under the statute. So, what we also have are several other places that generate power only occasionally, and those kick in during high demand. So that's what would, that would cover, be covered in this statute. However, again, we would have to prove their state of mind that they actually were aware of what they were doing and where they were breaking into. Thank you, Mr. Grums. Uh, members, any other questions? Okay. Seeing, oh, I'm sorry, Representative Gannadin, you have follow up? I was hoping to, um, thank you, Mr. Grimes. I was hoping to follow up with um, basically the same question to Mr. Tom about the prosecutor. Um, you noted in your testimony concerns about um, um, the contents of the last conversation, power generation facilities specifically during times of high demand that might be difficult to prove in um, before a fact finder. Can you explain why? Yeah. I Rep, I mean, our comments were just, you know, for this bill itself, um, we're just providing comments just to ensure if this is the policy change that the, the legislature, legislature would like to take, that we're able to prosecute these cases. So for our comments, uh, it's just cleaning up the, the language itself. We, you know, the department um, would like to know um, what that entails, we, we don't know at this point. Um, and, that, and that's the point of it is, is to make sure that, um, that we do know that this is what uh, somebody from HECO or somebody with HPD would be able to testify in court that this structure was a power plant. Why is it a power plant or this, uh, this structure is a power generation facility used specifically during times of high demand? Um, I don't know how they, they define those types of, of facilities. Um, maybe, you know, my thought is without having specific knowledge uh, would be maybe there's a there's an infrastructure that is used as almost like a backup generator. That's what I just, just from my basic understanding, just my thought is that when it's a for high demand, maybe they utilize this infrastructure as, um, as like a backup generator. And that in itself qualifies that facility as a, a critical electrical infrastructure. So for our purposes, if there's at least some signage um, that this facility specifically, when they jump over the fence, when they enter it, um, is at least notifying the individual uh, that what they are entering is a critical electrical infrastructure that might at least assist when we're prosecuting um, so that the individual that does enter or remain um, has knowledge that that's exactly what they entered into. And it's not this back and forth of, well, this infrastructure is a HECO infrastructure, but it might not be a critical electrical infrastructure as opposed to this infrastructure. So um, for us, for the department particularly, what we're looking at is just enough information to notify uh, the individual that is either um, allegedly committing this crime, that they are aware that they're with the intentional state of mind being in there, that they are entering and remaining in an infrastructure that has been determined uh, to fall under this class C uh, felon. If that, if that makes any sense, I apologize, Rep. No, no, you're, you're, you're describing a notice function for a prospective defendant, but um, the, the bill as written in on page two, line five says property is fenced, comma, enclosed, comma, or secured in a manner to exclude to the posted warning sites. So um, to your knowledge, enclosed, that could, you, you were using an example of like a, a big fence maybe with barbed wire um, is what you might be thinking of, but are there a lot of places that are just simply enclosed in any kind of way, like a rock wall or a few rocks or any kind of thing, and then just your presence there would be the prospect of a class C felony? I don't specific have specific knowledge of how these infrastructures, um, Mr. Maybe Mr. Grams, um, as they're the originators of this bill, might have more insight on to how their facilities 
um, are enclosed. I would imagine they're enclosed with some type of uh, fencing. Um, our particular comment on this would just be that not just that these warning signs have some type of indication so we can um, have that notification that this is particularly a critical electrical infrastructure. So um, I don't know if, if Mr. Grems has any indication on how all of his infrastructures are enclosed, uh, but I would imagine from what I've at least seen just driving that a lot of the electrical infrastructures do have some type of fencing around it. I'd like to redirect to Mr. Grimm's. Yeah. Yeah, so keep in mind, we're talking about electricity, which is fatal to people, right? So those facilities or are surrounded by fence, or they may be surrounded by a rock wall uh, that is got the anti-climb mechanism on them or enclosed in a building, which is secured. All of these facilities are secured in a manner to keep people out for their own protection. I think that's the key right there is you gotta remember that we're trying to keep people out to keep them safe and keep the infrastructure uh, working properly. I do agree, Mr. Tom brought up a very good point about notification and we're more than happy to work with prosecutors and law enforcement to ensure we have the appropriate signage and verbiage. Thank you. Thank you members. We've had extensive discussion on this. So, so I'm gonna ask a final call for any more questions. Yes, uh, Representative DeCoy. Um, Mr. Tom, please. Mark, Mark, thank you for being here. Mark. This question is directed to Mr. Tom. Mark, so when you folks, folks prosecute. I'm sorry, Vice Chair, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Yeah. Hold on, we're trying to fix that. Mark. Oh, shit. Um, for trespassing, how many of those properties you guys find that had signage but then signage was removed from those properties. I would I would have to look into that vice chair and get back to you. Um, I would follow up with our traffic misdemeanor division. I think they deal with a lot of the criminal trespass in the first through fourth degree. Um, but I mean, something that I guess in terms of that they would have signage that I know um, a lot of times like, um, closed park cases, you know, I could see um, cases where there might be vandalism on the signs that at the beach parks where they say, you know, when we have somebody entering and remaining on a beach park, um, we always have to look to make sure there's signage uh, present uh, to indicate that this beach park or this uh, community center is closed from this time to this time. So anybody in there. So again, it is like a notice um, I would say in some of those cases, we do have issues um, it, and the issues run into where an individual might be able to enter a beach at a certain point, but never cross any of those signage. Um, so the knowledge element that they are on a place where it is closed to the public at that time period, we run into that issue. We always need to make sure that the, that the sign is uh, clear and unobstructed and that, they, that the individual that is being cited would have at least come across that sign or should have knowledge that that sign was there before they were cited for that or prosecuted, if okay. that helps. The only reason why I'm asking you that is because most times when I come upon places like that, signs are either ripped down or they're shot at, yeah, or damaged. Um, that, that's what I'm asking. So if, yeah, I wanted to get that information. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions, let's move on to the next bill, which is 
House Bill 739, dealing with information privacy. And we have uh, a statement in opposition from the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, John Keene, who I do not believe is uh, present. And that's the only testimony we have. So we have no one to ask questions at all. Um, so let's move on to the next bill on the agenda, which is House Bill 1069, dealing with the Hawaii Cancer Center Research uh, Special Fund. And we have from the University of Hawaii, Randall Holcomb. Dr. Holcomb. Thank you, Chair Takayama. This is, uh, and uh, members of the committee, this is Clifford Martin. I'm the Associate Director for Administration, speaking for uh, Dr. Holcomb. Uh, the UH Cancer Center has submitted testimony in support of this bill, and we stand on this testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Members, any questions? Uh, seeing none, let's move on to the final bill. Um, House Bill 1071, dealing with the Board of Regents of the University of Hawaii Independent Audit Committee. And we have from the Board of Regents office, uh, Kendra Oishi. Go ahead, Kendra. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chair Takayama, Vice Chair DeCoit, and members of the committee. Uh, Kendra Oishi from the, uh, I'm the Executive Administrator and Secretary of the Board of Regents. Um, it, testifying in support of this bill and requesting an additional amendment and um, I'll otherwise just stand on my testimony and available to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, that's the only testifier we have on this, members, any questions? And before we uh, proceed, just let me explain that the re um, amendment requested by the Board of Regents would add a subsection that allows executive meetings um, with this audit committee with auditors. And secondly, allow meetings to proceed without the president of the university or uh, the chief financial officer present. So members, any questions? Seeing none, we'll recess for decision.
House Committee on Higher Education and Technology for decision making. First bill, we have um, House Bill 1067 relating to procurement exemption for the UH, uh, removing the sunset date. Um, Chair's recommendation is to move this out as a House draft with uh, technical amendments and um, adding a defective date. Uh, any questions, comments, or concerns? Uh, Vice Chair, would you take the vote? Members, recommendation of chairs to pass with amendments. Uh, Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Recognizing all members here, any reservations or needs? Seeing none, Chair, your measures adopted. Thank you, Vice Chair. Next bill, House Bill 1070, relating to exempting University of Hawaii campuses from certain uh, county <clears throat> uh, district permitting um, requirements. Uh, my suggestion is to move this out as a move this out as a house draft, but deleting the uh, section of the bill 304A, which uh, would have exempted uh, UH campuses from shoreline and special management area uh, requirements. So um, also adding a defective data and technical uh, corrections. Any questions, comments, concerns? Uh, seeing none, Vice Chair. Chair, uh, rec um, recommendation of chair is to pass with amendments Chair and Vice Chair vote aye, recognizing all members here. Any reservations or nays? Seeing none, Chair, your measures adopted. Thank you. Uh, next bill is House Bill 1226 <laughs> relating to violation of privacy. Uh, we um, heard testimony that this proposal may unintentionally impair the ability of law enforcement officers to do their job and other unintentional effects. So, can I defer this measure? House Bill 1312 relating to intellectual property. Uh, we heard concerns from uh, the Dean of CPAR, um, but I'm going to keep this measure alive. He expressed the willingness to talk to farmers who've expressed interest in this bill, and uh, hopefully something can come up this dialogue. So I'll move this out with a defective date. Um, questions, comments, questions? Members, recommendation of chair is to pass with amendments. Chair and vice chair vote aye. Recognizing all members here, any reservations, any nays? No vote. No vote for Rep. Okimoto. Chair, your measures adopted. Thank you. Our next bill is House Bill 33 relating to the Information Technology Steering Committee, changing some um, uh, term limits and uh, composition of members. Uh, Chair's recommendation is to move this out as a house draft with technical amendments and a uh, defective date. Questions, comments, concerns, uh, Vice Chair? Members, recommendation of Chair is to pass with amendments HB 33. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Recognizing all members here. Any reservations? Reservations, please. Reservations for Okimoto. Any nays? Seeing none, Chair, your measures adopted. Thank you. Uh, this next bill, House Bill 686, relating to critical infrastructure. Uh, we had extensive discussion on this. Um, I'm going to recommend we move this bill out with an amendment to um, maybe the section on page two, lines 19 and 20, or subsection two that makes reference to facilities um, used in periods of high demand. Is that Provision is um, unclear uh, in terms of enforcement. Um, I'll also want to note in the report language that um, recommend that the Judiciary Committee consider whether elevating this crime to a Class C felony is appropriate um, because it is currently a petty misdemeanor, but ask the Judiciary Committee to consider that uh, further. Also in the report language, uh, make it clear that this measure is not intended to interfere with uh, peaceful demonstrations or lawful protests. Members, any questions or comments or concerns? Representative Kahala. Chair, I appreciate your notes um, that you're adding into the report, um, but because the language is still the same and I do still have the same concern for um, Native Hawaiians and Indigenous rights activists, I will vote no on this, but I do appreciate your um, reports. Thank you. Any other members? Seeing none, Vice Chair. Members, voting on HB 686 with all those amendments. 
uh, chair and vice chair vote. I, uh, Rep. Capella votes no. Any reservations? Any other nays? No vote. No vote. Yeah. Rep. Gallant votes no. Thirty measures adopted. Thank, Thank you. you. Next bill is uh, House Bill Seven Thirty Nine related to information privacy. Um, can I defer this bill? Uh, can we further study? Um, House Bill 1069 relating to Hawaii Cancer Research Special Fund. I mean, and then the uh, reporting requirement, reporting, reporting requirements. Um, recommend moving this out as a house draft, changing the, uh, uh, making a defective date and technical changes. Questions, comments, uh, questions? Remember, it's voting on HB 1069. Recommendation of chairs to pass with amendments. Chair and vice chair vote aye. Recognizing all members here, any reservations? Any nays? Seeing none, chair, your measures adopted. Thank you. Uh, House Bill 1071 relating to the Board of Regents uh, Audit Committee. Chair's recommendation is to move this, uh, adopting the amendment suggested by the Board of Regents um, to allow executive session of um, meetings with auditors and also allowing the exclusion of UH president and chief financial officer from these meetings, along with the defective date and technical changes. Questions, comments, vice chair? Remember, it's voting on HB 1071. Recommendation of chair is to pass with amendments. Chair and vice chair vote aye. Recognizing all members here, any reservations? Any nays, seeing none, chair your measures adopted. Thank you. Finally, House Bill 1072 relating to UH tuition and fee special fund, uh, making certain changes in the disposition of the fund. Uh, chair's recommendation is to move this out as a house draft with the uh, defective date and technical changes. Any questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, Vice Chair. Remember, is voting on HP 1072. Recommendation of the chair is to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Recognizing all members here, any nays? Any reservations? Seeing none, share your measures adopted. Thank you, members. Have a nice day.